let, let me at least start by kind of introducing the, uh, the larger project here. Yeah, great. Um, and, then, and then maybe I can go ahead and introduce you, Matt. Sure. Um, but what, what we're working at here in the city of Goshen is, um, is a process towards creating a climate action plan um, within the city, for the city, with the city. Um, climate action plan is something that I'm still working at to de define for myself. And realistically, it's, it's an idea that around the world we're working to define. Um, and each community kind of needs to to define it for themselves. Um, uh, almost a year ago, when the youth climate, uh, the youth environmental resolution was passed, one of the things that was asked for in a, in a non-binding resolution was a climate action plan for the city of Goshen. So, um, here in our new Department of Environmental Resilience, one of the things that we are taking on in earnest is the work of defining for ourselves what a climate action plan is uh, and, and what it will require of us, uh, what we enter into joyfully, what we may enter into uh, maybe with dragging feet, um, and what we may discover is, is really hard to do. Um, all those things are important for us to, to face as we talk about a climate action plan. Um, we thought that it would be important to kind of set the stage for a more in-depth conversation about climate action planning by talking about some of the more tangible experiences of living and working within the environment of Goshen and thinking about our, uh, our emerging context of climate, uh, of climate change. So in, in that light, um, Teresa Saylor, uh, myself, and Brandy DeVoe, and, and uh, the Mayor's Environmental Advisory Committee began to think of, uh, we've been thinking in different, in different stages for the past year and more about what some of those things would be. Um, this is Matt Mearsman uh, from the St. Joseph River Basin Commission. Um, Matt, uh, is it getting ahead of things for you to tell us a little bit about the commission? And, um, is it, well, it, it is, if okay, that's okay. all right. No, but what I can right. tell you about is how I got to where, where I am, and I said to get around. I've only been at the commission for, for a few years, uh, but I've done a lot of work as a volunteer um, with a group called the Friends of the St. Joe River Association, uh, which is a 501c3 not-for-profit that works both in Michigan and Indiana. Um, started up as a river cleanup organization back in the 90s. Uh, husband and wife who had retired from their work, had a favorite fishing spot on the river and just saw, like I did, how much trash there was all the time. And he said, you know what, I'm going to do something about this. So uh, he, he went about, it was you know before the internet, before any of that, he drove up and down the river and he would stop at every bait shop he could find, he would stop at sporting goods stores, and he would talk to the people about wanting to connect up all the communities up and down the river to organize river cleanups and try to leave the river better than he found it. And uh, it was really incredible the support that he got in, in drawing over such a large area. Um, there are 15 counties that uh, drain to the St. Joe River. Um, you know, starts all the way just above the Indiana-Ohio border in Michigan and, uh, and comes this way. Uh, so he started out as this sort of folksy sit around and he would have their meetings at the coffee shop. People would come together and, and he would hold meetings kind of up and down. And, and some great cleanups sprung out of that. They also ended up getting involved in some water monitoring, um, especially with schools. So they were engaging some of the kids in schools and taking some volunteer monitoring samples and stuff, which was really cool. And they came to a time in the late 90s when uh, there was money available to do clean water projects. Uh, but in order to be eligible for this money uh, as a community or as an organization, there had to be an approved watershed management plan in place, which is a document that says, okay, how's the river doing? Um, what's good, what's bad? What do we need to do to make it better? Um, and so with that, uh, with, with a plan, you could access all this money from the EPA it would come through the states. And so they said, well, we should create one of these plans for the entire St. Joe River, which was unheard of, it had never been done at that scale especially bringing together two states 
Uh, so it was really innovative at the time. And uh, they, they secured a grant to, to write this plan. They hired people. And uh, they ended up pulling off a, a, a giant watershed planning exercise. Now, that document, and, and all, like many of these kind of things, largely maybe becomes sort of an item on the shelf. Uh, but what it did do is it's brought over a million dollars of project money for counties, uh, local soil and water conservation districts, sub-watershed groups to do uh, on-the-ground implementation pro projects because that plan was in place and sort of opened up a pathway to funding uh, for projects like that. And what was kind of interesting about the group, about the Friends of the St. Joe River group, so it started out as sit around the coffee shop, you know, have fun, go out and do river cleanups, have a hog roast, hands-on. And then in order to complete this massive plan, they had to bring the resource professionals to the table. They had to get everybody who was an expert in fish sampling or you know, who did water monitoring and bring all those folks in. And they did that. They were successful in bringing all these professionals, work, you know, changed the meetings to be in during the daytime, working hours, people all came. Plan got created. It's done. This is great. The funding's gone. All those people went away. Well, in the meantime, a lot of the people who were just residents or just citizens who were engaged, they, didn't, they kind of felt left out. They had sort of fallen away during that three years while they were developing the plan. And so the group was really at a crossroads after the plan was created. Like, what do we do now? What do we become? Like, we, we were this group that kind of did stuff, and that's where I got involved. That was sort of the, the time period at which I got involved in, you know, what have we done since then? Um, you know... We've done some other kind of cool projects, but I, I, I see the legacy of the group as, as um, a group for bringing people together who care about cleaning up the river. That's what it always was, no matter whether it was professionals or whether it was citizens. It was a place you could go to be with like-minded people and feel encouraged. You know, To go back to the story I told, it can be kind of depressing. It can be hard to stay at it when it comes to you know, water quality improvements, and hopefully that group is a little bit of a safe place, whether you're working in it, uh, professionally or whether you're a volunteer, it's a safe place to, uh, to be with friends. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I told you I love to paddle. That paddling actually comes through in this crazy obscure sport of marathon canoe racing. Uh, I spend hundreds of hours on the river every year. I go and compete in the biggest canoe races in North America. This one happens to uh, start at 9 p.m. at night up in northern Michigan with a running street, uh, running start down to the river, over 100 teams, racing for $50,000 in cash prizes oh and a lot of bragging rights. Uh, we start at 9 p.m. We finish around lunchtime the next day after paddling 120 miles to Lake Huron, portaging over six hydroelectric dams. Uh, it's totally crazy, but it is so much fun, and it totally connects up my love of being on the water with what I try to do to protect it. So I happened to find my dream job working for the St. Joe River Basin Commission. I, have, I told you guys about how as a volunteer leading the Friends of the St. Joe River Group, worked a long time on watershed management stuff, was aware that this thing existed, but really didn't understand it or know much about it. And, and when I say it, the St. Joe River Basin Commission was created uh, back in the 80s. Uh, it was a really exciting time when um, there was a bunch of energy around promoting the St. Joe River and all the lakes and streams that flow to it, so the Elkhart River, promoting them as a destination for fishing. Um, there had been these reports that it was this great bass fishery. The uh, state of Michigan was coming together with the state of Indiana to build fish ladders to bring big steelhead and salmon all the way through South Bend and Mishawaka up to almost the Elkhart County line. Uh, so there was all this excitement around promoting the river for recreation. Right about that same time, the local health departments and the state environmental agencies realized that the river didn't meet water quality standards for body contact, which meant we really, should we really be telling people to go fishing on it, to go playing in it, to, uh, you know, if it's not meeting water quality standards. So uh, there was a lot of concern. What do we do? Well, some legislators had an idea. We'll, we'll create a commission for that. You know, we'll create some body and we'll give them that job. We'll look like heroes for trying to solve the problem, and we'll let the locals and somebody else figure out what to really do about it. So uh, the, the commission was started in the 80s. It, uh, it was focused on uh, water quality improvement. Although its mission looks at both states, you know, it looks up to Michigan uh, to try to impact water there, the governance and the funding of the thing is all on the Indiana side. 
So because it was created by the Indiana State Legislature, the, uh, the, the money all comes from either the state or local governments, and that's who the members are. So we've got a board of 32. The commission uh, has 32 folks on it. Um, our scope's been expanded to include flood mitigation as well as water quality, and uh, we've got the mayors of all the cities. Uh, uh, I say all the cities. Um, I'm talking about all the land that drains to uh, the St. Joe River. Um, so we've got the health department, we've got the county surveyor, we've got a lot of folks who we should have on this commission. Um, and I guess, uh, I, anyway, I found my dream job in, in leading this thing, which was created to do the very thing that I'd been trying to do with a volunteer organization for a long time. And what was so great about it wasn't just that I'm getting paid to do it. Uh, that's not as important to me. What was excited is I had the sort of officialness that came with a state agency sort of attached to the mission. That was cool. Um, and I feel like there's some ability there to do something that I maybe couldn't have done with a not-for-profit, being the fact that it is a government entity. We, it also makes us very vulnerable. We could be taken away with one bill. Uh, and we, you know, so it's not all, it's an all great, but I think there's a lot of potential there. So an overview of where we're going to go today. I appreciate you guys sticking with me. Um, and if you've got to leave early towards the end, I don't mind, but I want to give you a little forecast of where we're going to go. Uh, first thing we're going to talk about um, where we are today with respect to our lakes and streams, how we got here, and where we maybe want to go, uh, how we get there together. Does anybody know what this drawing is trying to illustrate up here? A watershed. A watershed, exactly. Which I've heard is a dangerous word to use because a whole lot of people don't understand what it means. Uh, it simply means all the area of land that drains to a particular body of water. So every single body of water, be it a creek, river, stream, pond, Theoretically, it all has its own watershed. You could go out there on the landscape and delineate the area that drains just to that water body. And you could go up to the edge of it and you could pour a bucket of water. And if you pour just a little bit this way, it'll go to one creek. If you pour just a little bit the other way, it'll go to another creek. And we happen to sit in a really cool location, and I'll show you some pictures of that in a little bit. But the reason that matters, this is a little bit of a spoiler alert for later, why do we care about the watershed, is because what happens on the land, how the land is used, how it's managed, has the biggest impact on how much water we've got in our lake or stream and how good that water is. So that's why we care about watershed. That's why it's worth uh, getting to know a word and then getting familiar with it. This is a, just a, an air, a picture of the area that drains to the St. Joe. I mentioned 15 counties. This kind of gives you an idea of where we're at. Uh, the six counties in northern Indiana and the eight counties up on the Michigan side. I mentioned it started above the Ohio line, comes on down, dips down into Indiana, picks up the Elkhart River, which we'll see is pretty cool. That is the largest, the Elkhart River is the largest tributary to the St. Joe um, at over almost 700 square miles. Uh, you can get an idea of how it compares to some of the other big watersheds um, in, the, uh, in the basin. And then what's kind of cool is the St. Joe amongst, you know, so as mentioned, every body of water has a, has a watershed. So the Elkhart River's got one, it's part of the St. Joe. Well, the St. Joe is part of Lake Michigan. That's where it goes. So this gives you an idea of all the watersheds draining to Lake Michigan, where does the St. Joe stack up? It happens to be the third largest watershed of all the area draining to Lake Michigan, uh, including Wisconsin and, and uh, Michigan. And then uh, zooming back out a little further, the Lake Michigan watershed is just sub-watershed of the Great Lakes. And I think it's important to make that connection that where we live here is connected to the Great Lakes because they're incredible. They're amazing. And the statistics about the percent of the Earth's fresh water that lies in the Great Lakes, the potential for recreation. I do believe that the Great Lakes will be, if they're not already, the resource that people fight over in the future. I mean, that we wrap our arms around. These, this is a really special place to live. And we have a, a claim to that in the sense that we're living on land that's draining to that. We're in the watershed of the Great Lakes. Uh, the area that outlined in red is just the, the Lake Michigan Basin portion of the Great Lakes watershed. So we got a sense about where our water's coming from. I don't know if you paid attention to that Elkhart watershed map, but you know, coming from Noble County, some of it's coming from LaGrange County. We know where it's coming from, but how is it doing? How's the water? I think that's one of the, the roles the River Basin Commission was set up to address, is, is answering that question of, how's the water doing? Well, in order to answer that question before we really get into it, 
I think it's important to sort of distinguish between two things. They're, they're intimately connected, but it's worth talking about them separately. And that is, how's it doing with respect to water quantity versus how it's doing with respect to water quality? Um, we're going to talk about how they're connected, but the two things um, we need to pay attention to as we, uh, as we think about it. And, the, and, and what I want to do is kind of take us through time. Let's start with today. How's it doing? Um, some of you may know the folks or seen this boat out on the Elkhart River. Uh, this is my friend Dara Deegan. He's got some family in the room here today. Uh, his crew goes out every year and they do biological monitoring on the river. Take samples of fish. They sample bugs. The idea here is that in order to get a handle on how good the river's doing, especially with respect to water quality, um, it helps to look at what's living in it. Uh, it, it turns out that we can get a much better, it's way more cost effective and we can get a much better idea of the condition of the resource by looking at what's living in it rather than just measuring the chemistry of it. And the reason is rivers change like that. If we go out there and we take a sample and measure it, we're going to get one result today. If we get a little bit of rain, we're going to get a totally different result. A farmer applies manure, we might get a different result. City has an overflow, we're going to get something different. So they're just snapshots in time. By looking at what's living in the river, you can get a sense of trends over time. Because basically, there's a whole bunch of organisms that are really intolerant of pollution. So if, if things get nasty, they can't reproduce, and they die out. So when you only find communities that are really tolerant, really hardy things, you have a sense that this, you know, it may be good today when we take our sample, but it's it's bad a lot because otherwise there would be something better living there. So anyway, folks go out, sample the river. Every year they put out a report. How's the river doing? It turns out over the last several years, the river's been getting a little better, at least as far as what's living in it is concerned. The river's getting a little better. Uh, we've got like 70 different species of fish you can find in the St. Joe River. Um, and, and, and we're also getting more intolerant species. They're finding more intolerant species each year in general, which is encouraging. Okay, so, so some things are getting a little better. Uh, one of the things that uh, Aaron was going to mention as an introduction, we, there was some talk, there was a, a report released uh, from Elkhart County recently, the 2019 Surface Water Quality Report. The County Health Department goes out and takes some samples. Uh, around here they take them at Rock Run Creek, they take them at the Elkhart River at Indiana Avenue, and uh, they take them back to the lab and they, and they run the analysis. And the results of that analysis with respect to E. coli, I mean, we're finding some nutrients and certainly to suspended solids, there's, the water's dirty. But with respect to bacteria, we're finding some of it. I think something like 14 of the 18 samples that were taken at the Elkhart River down here at Indiana Avenue did meet the water quality standards for, water, uh, uh, for body contact. So they were lower than 235 colonies per 100 milliliters or something like that. So 14 of the 18 times they sampled on the Elkhart, it met the standards. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is that on you know, Rock Run Creek, for example, we never got below the standard. It was over it every time. It got as high as like 6,000 colonies per 100 milliliters. So you know, the threshold's 235, we're at 6,000. That sounds, that sounds kind of bad, right? So some things, you know, some things show good, some things don't. How about from water quantity perspective? I mean, uh, Aaron got the pictures out. I think if we all lived here over the last couple years, we know that we got a lot of flooding. It's going on. I mean, we got, we got a lot of water where we don't want it a lot of the time. So how's the water doing? Well, we got some better things living in it. We got a lot more of it than we want sometimes. Gives us a sense. But let's think about it over time. How about 100 years ago? So go back to the turn of the century, early 1900s. From a water quality perspective, how many people think the, the river was better, was cleaner 100 years ago than it is today? All right, good. You guys are sharp. This is good. All right, super. Was it? What's that? Was it cleaner? Huh, new. So it turns out about 120 years ago, there was some early research done on the St. Joe. Again, credit to my friend Dara for, for digging this stuff up. Uh, around early, like the 19-teens, uh, they found only two to three species of fish in the St. Joe River at that time. The E. coli content in the river was over 20 million colonies per 100 milliliters. So 
a hundred years ago, the water quality was scary. Exactly. On the on the mill race, there was a there was like a, a, a swimming pond or a swimming club yeah. or something. It was like this official thing. I guess people just they just did it. Yeah, they, and they, and they survived uh, it, nevertheless. We'll talk about how important the watershed is. You know, Elkhart maybe upstream of Goshen, Elkhart River upstream of Goshen maybe didn't have the same discharge issues that the St. Joe's have. Those statistics I just gave were for the St. Joe River, so okay. maybe it was a little different. Um, from a water quantity perspective, 100 years ago, a lot of us might not know about this, but some of the most disastrous, or you know, some of the most catastrophic natural disasters that occurred in the past were flooding related. So, you know, this is from the 1913, the Great Flood uh, in Indiana. This is a picture from downtown Indianapolis. Uh, folks out in canoes. Uh, looks not that different than what we had here a couple years ago. So uh, 100 years ago, water quality was definitely worse. Um, flooding? How many people think the flooding was worse 100 years ago than it is today? One. My, my sense is with the majority here. I, I think, you know, when we look at the data, uh, we've got some USGS stream gauges that are in place. And what we see on the St. Joe for our period of record, which goes back into the early 1900s, the flood we had in 2018 was the, the highest on record. Never had that much water moving through the St. Joe. So water quality seems to have gotten better in the last 100 years. Maybe not so much the case with water quantity. Let's go back a little further. How about 500 years ago? How many people think water quality was better 500 years ago? Before yeah. humans started it. Well, there was humans here. They were building really cool shelters like that. Uh, but they weren't doing some of the things we were doing. Um, how about from a flooding standpoint? How many people think flooding was uh, better, less flooding back then? Yeah. Yeah, we don't have any data, but that's certainly my, what we do. We have really cool stories about uh, people fording across the river. You know, they, there's what's called the Sauk Trail. It's most of it's just on the other side of the state line, but it was the main path between Detroit and Chicago. And it crossed the St. Joe River in Niles, Michigan. And I always thought about, like, I used to work in Niles, Michigan. How did these people walk across this river? Well, they did it because the river wasn't going up and down. The river was, like, stable. It just flowed the same right across the riffle almost all year round. The stories that I've heard are, like, uh, that, well, we'll talk about that later. It's, it's too exciting for me, sorry. <laughs> so what changed? What changed to kind of turn the corner for us on water quality but hasn't helped us with our flooding. How we use the sewage overflows. Yeah, yeah. And, and did we just decide to do that because we thought we'd be nice to the river? We were required to. That's that. right. So, uh, regulation. <laughs> regulation, exactly. And we're going to talk about that because it is controversial and uh, getting more so every day. Um, the Clean Water Act was passed uh, in the 70s. And it said, basically, if you're going to discharge out of a pipe into the waters of the United States, you're going to have to get a permit, and you're either going to have to meet water quality standards, or you're going to have to mitigate the impact of that discharge. So the Clean Water Act was passed, and uh, we saw... <laughs> Tremendous improvement. I mean, we, everybody in this room maybe has heard the stories about rivers burning in Ohio, and uh, you know, we've got stories about what it was like around here, too. But basically, in order to discharge, whether you're a community with your wastewater treatment plant or you're an industry, in order to discharge to the river, you have to get a permit, and you have to meet water quality standards. You're going to be out there sampling and testing it, holding, holding it to what they said uh, you do. Um, this is the South Bend Wastewater Treatment Plant, not too far from my home. So they got to get a permit. They have to test their water, all this stuff. <clears throat> I'm going to be trying to convince you today that you know, the, the, the regulation you know, helped turn the corner for us. But i got to tell you, when I'm out in my canoe paddling past the outlet of that wastewater treatment plant, all that's going through my head is, don't tip over here. <laughs> I do not want to swim here. This is scary. Uh, but the folks that I know that work at this place, they swear that the water quality coming out of the treatment plant is cleaner than the water that's in the river. And honestly, I believe them from their sampling, but I can't, it's a mental thing. It's like, there's no, no way. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, 
It's a fact. I mean, there's no question that the regulation we put in place. Now, why I said it's controversial is there's a whole bunch of debate around what constitutes a pipe discharging to the river. So we know that that is one. The last one I showed you, that's clearly one coming right out of the factory with that stuff. What about all the drain tiles coming off of a farmer's field that go into a ditch? Are those point sources of pollution that need a permit? Not according to the courts. Now, the other thing where it gets real controversial is what constitutes the waters of the United States? If you guys hear about the debate around it's something called WOTUS, it's, a, it's an acronym for Waters of the U.S. They're, they are up for debate, and it is scary how many streams could lose their status as waters of the U.S. And it's not just streams, it's wetlands. And we're going to talk about what wetlands are. But there's a whole bunch of areas that are now considered waters of the U.S. that will not be if uh, the law follows through the way it looks like it's, it's going to go. And... Uh, you know, it, it, this covers not just pipes dumping pollution, but if you want to go and build a driveway or a road through a wetland and you're going to bring fill in, you have to get a permit. You have to mitigate for that right now. Who knows what the future will, will hold. Um, so, the regulation helped us turn the corner, right? I mean, we're getting better from a water quality standpoint, but we still see what we saw in 2018 in the way of flooding. So, why are some things getting worse? So, some things have gotten better, some things have gotten worse. We talked about regulation. Maybe it's regulation. Well, in that case, maybe it's about what's not being regulated. Maybe, you know, that's, that decides to be the fight we're going to take. Is this, we just need to regulate more stuff. Uh, and so all those pipes coming off the field, we've got to regulate those. Uh, you know, all the wetlands, we should regulate all of them. Maybe. Uh, that's, not, uh, that's not the argument that I'm going to make. Uh, well, we can talk afterwards about my personal feelings, but... Um, I, it's just not worth my time right now. Uh, so what I'm going to suggest we do is thinking about why it's getting worse. Uh, not from a standpoint of uh, not enough regulation, um, not a standpoint of climate change, which is something somebody else might say, well, yeah, flooding's getting worse because we've got a whole lot more rain coming in. Maybe. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But that's still not where I'm going to go yet. Uh, we're going to talk about what the, the causes of it. So, so what's not regulated is this. Runoff coming off the land. It's not coming out of a pipe. What's clearly not regulated is this. Okay? And it's not just what's coming off of you know, our streets, which we can imagine. Say, I, you know, I mentioned it earlier when I see on the river the rainbows and stuff like that. This is not regulated. Now, some of our folks from the city might argue that actually we do have to meet some standards at the end of our pipe at the end of the treatment train. But for stormwater, it's still not like a point source discharge that's getting measured in, in the same way. And frankly, a whole bunch of this stuff is not going to a, a municipal collection system. It's going right off the county road into the river. So we know we got runoff coming off, off of agricultural areas. We got runoff coming off of our urban areas. Why is it getting worse? Why are we getting more runoff? I want to think about it from the perspective of our plumbing and, and, and use that sort of analogy that, that we've got a whole bunch of plumbing out there on the landscape and I want us to kind of dig into how it's functioning, how it's working, what it's doing because I think that's where the answer lies is really thinking hard and maybe about regulating more of it. I don't know, but it's just thinking about how we do our plumbing. So in order to think through this example about plumbing, um, I, I should just say, some of the plumbing is obvious, some of it's not. Um, big storm drains, pretty obvious. I'm going to show you some things you're like, that's part of our plumbing? Yeah, so some of it's obvious, some of it's not. Some of it's public, some of it's private. Some of it was very intentional, some of it's not. So open your minds about what our plumbing is, okay? And let's go back. Let's start with our plumbing 500 years ago when we didn't have the problems that we have now. You know, it may not have been built by humans, although we had an influence around here. We were burning prairies. We were doing some things. But what, what did the plumbing look like 500 years ago? If it could someone, I've thrown out some words that, are, that, that you could use to describe the early plumbing. Wetlands. Wetlands. There was 
wetlands all over the place. They act like sponges on the landscape, right? They hold the water. We had meandering rivers and creeks. Meandering is how a river manages its sediment load. Lays it on the inside of a corner, cuts it from the outside. You know, does, so we had creeks and streams that were moving water. What's another one, though? Aaron, come on. What you got one? It's right in your, in your wheelhouse. Trees. Exactly, trees. The canopy was capturing so much water that there was, there's arguments that almost no, this is what I was going to tell you earlier, there's almost no water reached the St. Joe River as runoff prior to European settlement. That it, like the water in the river, the water in the lakes was a surface expression of groundwater. It was just water coming up out of springs. No water ran over the top of the earth in our area. It, it went in, even during our snowmelt periods. And some of that had to do with the canopy. Some of it had to do with the deep-rooted plants that were in the places that we didn't have canopy in the prairie. The soils were like just taking up tremendous amounts of water, holding it, releasing it through the summer. I mean, there was plumbing out there. I mean, the water, it, there's a, I want us to think about it in terms of biology and hydrology. So biology, what's living on the surface? You might even get down to the microscopic level, what's living in the soil? But the more of it, the more diverse it is, and the more we have, the better the ground is at, at working as plumbing, taking the water in and holding on to it. Uh, and hydrology is just a fancy word for how does the water move through the system? So that was part of how the water moved through the system. Okay, that was 500 years ago. Man, it sounds great, doesn't it? Um, so how about 100 years ago? What did the plumbing look like 100 years ago? Uh, this one's super close to my house. I paddle by here all the time. This is early 1900s, um, what became known as the Uniroyal plant, but at one time it was the ball band woolen mill and made ball band tennis shoes. Uh, my grandma used to work at this place, and she said that uh, she lived just across the river. No one would go anywhere near the river. That they, when they were dying tennis shoes, the whole river would turn red, and, you know, I've mentioned two to three species of fish was all that was living in there. There was direct discharge from this giant factory just dumping, spewing stuff. Another thing that was going on this time 100 years ago was we were building some of our first pipes in the ground. We were installing some of our, our plumbing underneath the ground. And the reason we were installing it is as we built up and created hard surfaces that the water didn't soak into, whether that be roads or our buildings, we started having a whole bunch of water around. We were, we were in flooding issues in our communities. So we built these pipes under the ground to carry that water out of the city, carry it to the river. It wasn't built for our sewage to begin with. It was built to get storm water off the streets and into the river. But you could probably imagine what happened when indoor plumbing became a thing. Well, we got these pipes underneath there. Just hook into those, and that's a great place to send all our, our sewage to. So. Um, Plumbing was getting, getting scary from a water quality perspective, not to mention flooding, you know, 100 years ago. And it wasn't just in our cities. So actually, what I like to think a lot more about is all of our agricultural land out there. There was a whole bunch of plumbing being installed out there. This is an example of an old uh, steam-powered dredge. And this kind of thing, this one might be from the Kankakee River, but it was certainly, there, these things were used all over the place to straighten out the river, make it deeper. Uh, at the same time, we were clear cutting the landscape. Uh, so totally removing the vegetation that's holding the soil in place. Uh, I mean, we were setting it up perfect to just transport a ton of sediment and a ton of water down a chute. Um, so we were installing, and this is also the time when some of our first drainage tiles, if you know anything about farming, we bury clay pipes underneath the field to help get the water out of here faster so we can get on it with our tractor, or we can get out there and harvest. We were doing a lot of really, really uh, innovative plumbing around 100 years ago. And it's true. I mean, we, we wouldn't have the food production system that we have today if it weren't for a lot of plumbing out there on the landscape. And, and the, the early uh, path for that was laid 100 years ago. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it's, you know, I eat from the grocery store too. So um, that was 100 years ago. What about our plumbing today? Some of it I mentioned is obvious. Um, but I don't know if we think about it like that. I, I think this actually might be an example of, of a not obvious one to people. Uh, we're going to think about this from the watershed perspective again. So I'm going to show you a map of our plumbing. I'm going to show you several maps of our plumbing. So anybody know what this one is? 
what the yellow lines on this map, that's the St. Joe Basin. What are all those yellow lines? The no, good guesses. I just showed an image of it, right one slide before this. Storm sewer, storm drainage? Related to it. Roads. Oh, roads. We built, this is an unintentional one. We built roads all over the place and effectively created a whole bunch of plumbing all over the landscape. We changed how the water is moving everywhere on the landscape by building roads everywhere. Even our gravel roads change how water moves through the system. So, you know, massive amounts of water and infrastructure out there in the way of roads. How about this one? Anybody got any guesses as what these yellow lines, and, and by the way, that little hole where Cass County is, there's a ton of yellow lines there too. I just didn't have the data when I made the map. Anybody got any guesses as to what all those yellow lines are? Someone said it a minute ago. Yep, uh, regulated drains. So these are ditches that were declared by a court to be public drainage waterways, which means there's a, a mechanism in place to raise funds for the maintenance of these things. Uh, it means that an elected official has the right to go in there and monkey with them on our behalf. So we got some, we got some plumbing out there in our agricultural lands too. Just an example of what we would see in the way of ditches, um, regulated or not. Both of these things have led to uh, a dramatic change in land cover. I'm not going to quiz you on that map. That's what that map's showing. It looks like a mess probably from where you're sitting. But that is maybe our land cover uh, two or three years ago from satellite data. Um, what I want to draw your attention to is what's left in green is what is the natural land cover remaining. It's less than 25% of our land cover. Uh, so that, that plumbing we had out there on the, on the surface 500 years ago, we only got about 25% of it left. And it's not all about turning it to hard surfaces like development. So the areas in gray are where we have hard surfaces. If you zoom in on this stuff, you can see all those roads running through there. What I want you to draw your attention to is like 70% of the land in the watershed is now used for agriculture for, of some kind. So what's orange is row crops, what's yellow is uh, pasture or hay ground. Um, so we, that, that change in land cover change the biology of what's growing on top of the earth, which changes the hydrology because it doesn't infiltrate water at the same rate. It creates runoff in a way that you know, prior land cover didn't. So that is one that we really got to wrap our heads around. How much of a change in how water is moving through the surface of the earth just by the nature of the change in land cover. And that actually gives us some hope. Um, and, and I think that this, this is a, a demonstration, if any of you are farmers or if you ever go to the field days put on by the, there's going to be one next Wednesday. Uh, Elkhart County Soil and Water Conservation District is doing a big cover crop field day. And if you know any farmers, encourage them to go. I don't know whether they're going to have one of these things set up, but they are the coolest things ever. Uh, gives you a really visual take home. I mean, it, it hits you how differently water moves through the system depending on what's growing on top of, on top of land. And it's not just from a water lover's perspective like me, like, oh, look how clean the water that comes off of this one that's got cover crops and roots and stuff growing in it. What it's really about is when you pull this white panel away, the farmer sees how much more water infiltrated into the ground because behind that white panel is another bucket that is all the water that went down, not out. So that's what we really want people to see is like, it's not about saving the river, it's about saving the water for your crop this year. <clears throat> so. Depending on what's going on, it makes a big difference in how water moves. Okay, how many, anybody got any guesses about, uh, oh, dang, it's on the legend. <laughs> <laughs> it was mentioned a lot, we talk about a lot, so wetlands. Everywhere you see there that is red is what used to be a wetland and no longer is. What you see in green is what's left. And I gotta say, that Indiana did a whole lot better job of Michigan of getting rid of those things. Those darn wetlands, they breed disease, snakes, uh, bugs, you know, we can, we can do without those. So we really went after it uh, a little bit stronger than our neighbors in Michigan did. And we've lost something like 70% of the wetlands. Well, across the state, it's almost 90%. But in the St. Joe Basin on the Indiana side, 70-some percent. Michigan side is more like 50. Um, we lost those guys. When we talk about losing them, I mentioned filling them in. But there's something else that goes on, too. This is more modern. I mentioned clay drain tiles earlier. What this machine is doing, and you'll see this all over the place this time of year, uh, or then in, into the fall, actually, we just got through where you see a lot of it. You'll see the, the evidence of it. The, their drain tile is going in left and right. This black pipe that's getting buried in the ground has holes all throughout it. Helps move that water out of the system. 
<laughs> Causes water to go up, arguably some water quality issues, but again, I think there's some opportunities. We'll talk in a second. There's some opportunities of how we can maybe do better, where we can still get on the field, but uh, not, um, not lose out on all the water quality benefits of, of having that water stay in there. All right, last, uh, last quiz. Who knows what this is, what we're looking at on this map, what all those red lines are, red areas? Tributaries off of the river? They are tributaries, a lot of them, lakes and tributaries, yep. But the significance of the red ones? Dry, are they dry? What was it? They said, are they dry? No, nope. no. Nope. <laughs> Impacted, that's a good guess, like uh, impaired waters. No, actually, this one's a trick question. This is all the places in the St. Joe River Basin that I've paddled. <laughs> so, oh, there's a the red. That's just uh, where, where I've gotten out and about. Yeah, so, yeah, that was just last one for fun. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and I'm uh, showing off all the, all the paddling that I've done out there. Um, okay, so now we're at the part where we're going to talk about how do we get to where we want to go. But before we talk about how we get to where we want to go, I think we all need to agree on where that is. So most times when I show this presentation, I get to this part where I've talked about the wetland drainage and the land cover change, and be like, what are you saying, man? You, you want us to just roll back the clock, go back to foraging for nuts and berries and stuff? Again, we can talk afterwards about my personal opinion, but I know that that's not a prescription that I can get everybody on board with. That's not going to be a, a, a where we're trying to go that we're all going to agree on. So rather than just turning back the clock. Let's see if we can come up with a definition that we can all agree upon about where we're trying to go. And I would argue that, well, let me just ask, how many people want a future with clean water and less flooding? <laughs> yeah, right? Okay, so let's just stay there. We want a future with less water and clean Okay, that's where we want to go. Um, how about <laughs> rolling in resiliency, sustainability? Um, you know, we just, Melissa and I were just at a, a, a conference out of Mary Lee, and uh, it was all about sustainability, and one of the speakers was great, she's like, does anybody know what sustainability even means? And, and obviously, your office, Aaron, does, but it's, uh, if, for you don't know, it is meeting the needs of today without compromising the needs of the future. So, with respect to our food system, with respect to our community's infrastructure, when we're going to go out there and build roads, we're going to dig ditches, we're going to bury pipes, if we could all have the goal of sustainability and resiliency in mind, you know, building pipes that, that work for today without compromising our ability to grow food in the future, I think we can all stay on the same page if that's where we would like to go. So if that's the case, come on with me and I'm going to give you some examples of, you know, how, um, how we might go about getting there. Uh, long story short, we want to make the place spongier. <laughs> Uh, we want to stabilize flow. If we, can, if we can take those big peaks out, not only will we have less flooding, we're going to have cleaner water. So how, how, what's some ways we can go about doing that? Um, better plumbing. I think we can do better with our plumbing. Um, this is just a simple desktop experiment to show people how much dirtier the water is when you don't have something growing on top of it. But let's get into some, some, some better examples. So here in Goshen, um, talk about plumbing that looks like plumbing. Uh, the city invested a whole bunch of money in a wet weather, wet weather detention facility. They got out ahead of a problem that most of the other communities in the river basin are still faced with. Now, we'll be paying the bill on that for a while, and we're going to talk about maybe how we can do that. But the, the idea is we spent a whole bunch of money to capture that first flush that comes through when we get a big rain event. we got a giant concrete monstrosity storage thing that we can direct all that water to, and then treat it as we can keep up with it. You know, we can take it out of there and, and clean it up before we send it to the river. It's, it, it's gray technology, it's expensive technology, but it's helping us meet our requirements. And so uh, kudos to Goshen for getting ahead on this. Um, I think that's obvious. Uh, another one that's, that's maybe, it's certainly not as obvious from the top because you don't see it. But over in South Bend where I live, We've invested a whole bunch of money in what are called smart sewers. And we're out there, we've got all these monitors all over the place because they real once they put the monitors on, especially, it confirmed that there is a whole bunch of times when the sewer system can't keep up with all the rain and storm water that's coming at it. And so it was just discharging straight. But what they realized is there was a whole bunch of other pipes in the city where maybe the rain wasn't falling as hard. 
that were like three quarters empty. So they said, well, if we can measure this stuff all over the place and we can put some valves and diverters in there and have real-time control of them behind a computer, we can like redirect it and close it. And basically, they got to the point now with all this technology they got underneath the ground that they can ensure that every single cubic inch of pipe that's already buried under the city is full before anything's discharged. So it's essentially a similar way to what Goshen did in terms of trying to maximize our capacity to hold on to it before we let it go. So there's some, some things we can do. I mean, we still got a long way to go in South Bend. So uh, another example of a less obvious one, I've mentioned our roads, our streets. How about making them places that soak water rather than sending the water to the side? So we've got pretty sandy soils around here in a lot of places. There's some potential to infiltrate water. We can do that with better roads. This is South Bend. Uh, and they're smart streets, but they're all about smart things in South Bend. Smart sewers and smart streets. Smart mayors. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right, so um, I mentioned, you know, I think the examples I've shown, they're, they're public plumbing. So this is our plumbing that's out there on the landscape, but it's the sewer pipes, the wet weather detention facility, all that stuff's public. This is too. This one is over in uh, Steuben County, but we have them here in Elkhart County as well. Um, it's a regulated drain. But not just any old regulated drain, it's a regulated drain that they've taken and tried to recreate a floodplain down at the level that the, the ditch is flowing at most of the time. <coughs> it's referred to, maybe you've heard of a two-stage ditch. That's what this is. We've got some of them here in Elkhart County, got some of them in Goshen or Dunlap at least. Uh, and they, they're working. I mean, we've, we've seen, they, they increase the storage capacity. They're not cheap, you know, because when you take and you remove all that material there, you gotta put it somewhere. And that's expensive. And you're taking away someone's crop production ground. They used to grow corn on that. So how's that person going to be compensated? Where are they, are they get, the people that make these decisions are elected officials. Are they going to be able to get reelected if they go and take your acres of corn away and turn it into a floodplain? Probably not. Probably not in many cases. So there's a whole thing about political will and that the people have to want this collectively before a leader can do anything. Better ways to do our public infrastructure, but not so. Th this one is public in the sense it's a storm drain. It's here in Goshen, but I, this is kind of for me where I transition into. There's a whole bunch of stuff that us people, private, voluntary choices about our behavior, influence the plumbing. And you know, I think of this little art piece as a way to remind people that that storm drain is not going to a place that's going to process it and clean it up and all that stuff. It's going to the river. It's going to a pond. It's going to a wetland. So think about it differently. Think about it as the wetland itself, not some piece of hard infrastructure that's going to take care of all of our problems for us. So just a couple of things. I've mentioned some of them already that we can do voluntarily. And I say we. If you're a farmer, you can do this. But there's some for homeowners too. Uh, this is an example of no-till agriculture. It's a way to increase the amount of soil organic matter, increase the amount of water that can infiltrate. It's got some other benefits. Uh, but I have to point out, and we'll talk about why it's so important. You notice that, so on the right is what's no-till. On the left is what's uh, conventional till, corn. Notice any difference between the two? One of them looks smaller. Doesn't look as quite as good, does it? Yeah. We gotta be real about that. And no-till doesn't work for everybody. It doesn't work for everybody out there. And even where it does work, there's a time period where it doesn't look as good. And if you live in a society, a social, you go to the coffee shop, and you're the guy farming on the right, your buddies are laughing at you like, yeah, no tell, it's working out really good there. We got to address that. We got to be honest about it. And, and again, I'm going to hit on it's so important if it's not clear to you already. But we have to be honest about that. And, and, and look to the data. The data shows that they do competitions every year between no-till and conventional till, and year after year, they come out on par. Like, it, for a lot of ground, now it doesn't work everywhere, but on a lot of ground, you're gonna yield as much. The profitability, I think, is the more important thing they'll talk about. It's not about yield, it's about profitability. The, the amount of money you spend input compared to what you get out. Um, so, we just gotta be honest about that and, uh, and recognize it doesn't work for everybody and there's a huge hurdle to overcome. Uh, we can do stuff at home. This is an example of a rain garden in Elkhart County. Um, you know, sort of 
thinking about soaking more of our water in on our lawn rather than sending it to the street or the storm drain. Better plumbing that we can install. Uh, last one, uh, again, homeowners, rain barrels. We had a program here in Elkhart County to help you cost share on these things. Hold on to it. Use it for something. I think one of the things that I mentioned in my story that I started with is trying to think about water as a maybe even sacred resource, but certainly a resource, not a waste product. It's not something to get rid of. I mean, and that's a hard message to sell when it's 2018 and it looks like this. You tell me this is a resource, it is all over the place where I don't want it. We got to find a better place to put it, not getting rid of it. We got to figure out how to st uh, store it in the ground. All right, I'm getting there. Okay, so back to regulation. We're getting close. Um, it is one way to go about it. We saw the, the impact that regulation had on turning the corner for our water quality. Um, I tend to focus my efforts, it's kind of cool, the St. Joe River Basin Commission, one of its statutory powers is to advocate on behalf of the river. So um, it's really cool I get to go out to Washington, D.C. once a year, part of Great Lakes Day, and talk to our legislators about the importance of the Great Lakes. I go down to D.C. and get involved on some legislation sometimes when I can. Um, but what I, what I want to focus on with our policy and with our regulation, because it is not a good time. Well, I don't want to discourage anybody, but right now it seems a lot of resistance to new regulation, okay? How about just local policy that creates an incentive for people to behave better on their own property? So maybe, yeah, you know, maybe you don't uh, have to meet some standard to this, but maybe you get a break on your stormwater bill if you've got a rain garden, if you've got a rain barrel. I mean, we're already looking at what the land cover is, how much parking lot you have compared to how much grass you have. So we're, we need to build those kinds of things into our financing system so that there is a reward for holding on to the water and not spending all of our public money treating it, and then create maybe a penalty for, it's not a penalty, it's just a service fee. Basically, if we as a city or we as a county have to spend money managing your runoff, you got to pay for it. So how about charging based on how much you send us? You know, we can get at some of these things, and I think there's some hope there with our policy. And this is really good. Whether we're talking about policy change or whether we're talking about individual people making choices on their home site or their farm, it's hard. I mean, it is really hard to change behavior. Uh, and, and it's hard for our leaders to change policy if they don't have the will of the people. I really feel, and I said this at, at uh, Mary Lee this, this last weekend, building relationships and building trust is probably the largest part of what I do. I, I think that if, if we're going to have any hope of change, people have to believe you. They have to trust what you're trying to If you're trying to sell them that sand tastes good and you should just eat it you know, because it's good for us and People aren't going to buy it. It don't sound good to me. we got to talk in language that speaks to someone's existing values. You know, if you're a farmer, maybe that's profitability. Uh, you know, if, if you're a municipal uh, leader, maybe it's your budget. You're, you know, you're, you're, how do we finance this? Who's going to support me? I mean, there's a lot of issues there. And it, in whether we're talking policy or whether we're talking voluntary, it all comes down to, to building trust, I believe. So... Um, I, that's it, except for this thing was about climate and how we go into the future. So I stuck two slides in here that I stole from Melissa uh, from her presentation. She's from the Purdue Climate Research uh, Center. And, uh, oh, she's got little fancy slides. They, I didn't know they did all that. So more water is coming, uh, and, and it's coming in different ways. Uh, this is the one, oh, geez, she's got all kinds of things. This is the one oh, that, that I thought was, and it doesn't have the full thing. Okay. So the thing is, maybe you've heard we're getting more water. That's what all the models, all the science experts predict. As we go into the future, we're going to have more rain. What I think is really interesting is it's not just that we're going to have more rain. It's when we're going to get it. And what this is trying to show, I messed up the arrows and stuff, but maybe 8% overall increase, but it's all coming in the winter and in the spring. And the problem with that is we don't have living roots. We don't have vegetation growing to take that water and use it during the winter. So it runs off, which exacerbates our problem. We get less of it in the summer and fall when we have something there to take it up. So although I focus most of my talk on how you know, our behavior as individuals or communities fiddling around with the earth and changing the plumbing of it and all that, how that impacts the thing, 
I don't think it's a big stretch to think about how much of an impact changing the input will have on the whole thing. And it's probably not going to help our situation. You know, all the more reason for good plumbing. So with that, I'm going to stop. And I don't know if folks have questions, but it is, uh, we're past time. And I thank you for your attention. Advocacy is one of the things that comes to mind. I mean, we've got, there, there's legislation all the time. Like right now, there's a bill uh, in the Indiana State House, Senate Bill 229. It's about deregulating some of our wetlands uh, for certain people. Um, might not be the direction we want to go. I don't know. I mean, um, but it, getting involved in some of that, sort of watching. Um, there are some not-for-profits that kind of help with that. The Hoosier Environmental Council is one. Um, but getting above the advocacy, talking to your representative, um, that would be one thing that comes off the top of my head. Um, I don't know, I mean, if you haven't already, Goshen's got a great stormwater department, and you know, you might talk to them about if there is any opportunity to volunteer. River cleanups actually can be something, that's, although trash really isn't our, our real problem, arguably, I mean, maybe if you're a paddler and you want the river to be beautiful, it is. But I think it's a great metaphor, like all that trash that you can see with your eyes is actually just an illustration, like what we really got to deal with is all these things we can't see that are in the water, and even the water itself in terms of volume. So, but promoting, holding the event as a river cleanup so people can get involved and actually do something, but then really being clear about your messaging and, and where our problems are. So, yeah. When's the next cleanup at the St. Joe River? The Friends are holding the South Bend one in... I, can't, I, I don't know for sure if it's been scheduled, but I think it is Earth Day weekend, like the Saturday closest to Earth Day. Okay. Look to IUSB uh, sustainability. They, they will be posting something on it, um, or you can reach out to me, and I'll make sure when the date IUSB. is announced. Yeah, IUSB sustainability, or you can reach out to me personally. Do other watersheds in Indiana also have commissions? Some. Uh, they tend to be a northern Indiana thing, so the Kankakee has one. The Kankakee was the first. They all have different purposes, though. Kankakee was really like a multi-county drainage authority. Um, the Maumee, which is to our east, uh, drains Fort, to Fort Wayne. They have a commission. Theirs was around flood control. So they've built, uh, they've removed homes from the floodplain and, and done some maybe levee work real early. But there are some. They all have different, uh, different purposes. And there was the Elkhart River Watershed. Right so, there, right, so there, there are definitely watershed groups in the way of not-for-profits that exist out there, and they're the ones doing a, a, the majority of the, of the work like this. Um, so I'm hoping the River Basin Commissions can become more active in that, but not all of them have the same statute that we do, which ours, I think, is pretty well-crafted. That's the that's maybe part of my question. So you have all these different watersheds and different groups. Yeah. To really make a, a significant impact, you've got to bring everybody together. Is right. there anything that's in the future that looks like that? Man, I, I really hope the commission itself can sort of serve that role, not only through our quarterly meetings where these, you know, you have six people from each county that are supposed to be there, you know, and there are the water people, someone from the health department, you know, the surveyor, so the water is there. So, but those are sort of official. That's where the story I told before, we got technology working kind of a, how I imagine a friends group or, or an Elkhart River Restoration Association group as being that sort of um, fraternal organization that people can kind of come to with like minds and get help from each other and stuff. So, I mean, I would like the commission to be that, but I understand it's limited because it is state government. There's some things we can't do that the friends groups or the ERRA groups can do. So there's a role for both. This is not particularly water, but it's on climate change. And if we're talking about what we can do, I oh, think right. tomorrow the, um, the Senate Committee on Utilities is going to look at House Bill 1414 right. that would possibly delay the closing of coal fired power plants. And I think that's the most significant thing for climate change 
Blake Dorio told me he thinks he's going to vote for that. No. It's, well, he told me he was probably going to vote for it. But we need to, he is on the utilities committee. The vote, I think, comes up tomorrow, right from tonight. Can you repeat that? I'm really telling his House Bill 1414. So it passed the House by a really close vote, so it's coming to the Senate. And what is that 1414? What is it? Well, it could possibly delay the closure of coal-fired electricity plants. And, and coal is the big source, you know, of carbon and, and, and climate change. We think. It's probably the most significant thing that would help our climate is right. to close and you, those coal. you feel plants. that would be an advantage to close those places? Well, yes. And Nipsco and all the utility companies want to do that. They're on a 10-year plan to close them. And so now this, the House and the Senate possibly wants to slow the closure of that down which is, I think, terribly wrong for the environment. And they need to hear from constituents. I agree. Why are, why are they supposed to do that? Because coal companies, lot, because coal companies supported their, or their Senate races. Probably, I don't know. Yeah, probably. Did you have a yeah. question? Uh, what are, what are the, the powers of the commission? You guys, I mean, uh, you, you, don't, you don't set pollution standards. You don't have funding for infrastructure. No, we you, exist to be a forum for the discussion, study, and evaluation of the water resource. Okay. So, I mean, we don't, we don't have any strong powers, but we do have the power to advocate. I mean, and, and can you fund studies, too? Yes, we just started our first one upstream here in the okay. north branch of the Elkhart River. So how do we support the continuing of the money for for your right? Um, he just left, but Pat right Mayor call, uh, Mayor Stutzman on the back for support. I mean, right. we, yeah. we put it in our city budget. Yes, so exactly. Yes, so uh, and thank you to you too then. Uh, and you know, same thing for the county. Elkhart County is a big supporter. So. Um, I guess, you know, this is the question when I, I go to a lot of commissioner meetings and, and occasionally get to a council meeting, but it's like, what can we do for, I mean, given our powers, given our limited, you know, how can we be a resource back to you? So uh, help me with that, you know, as much as we can. Like, what are ways that the commission could add value to, to return the investment that the communities are making to us financially? It's just me right now. I'm part-time and I plan to keep it that way. But we are bringing somebody on, hopefully in the next month or so, to kind of help um, deliver some more some more programs. So I, I was kind of looking for some a recognition that there might be an effort to reclaim wetlands. I mean, I was kind of surprised that Indiana has gotten rid of as many as I know it has, but I didn't know it was that. Yeah, I mean, the, technically there are efforts. I mean, at the federal level, there is a pot of money that comes through the farm bill that will pay a landowner to restore the wetlands on their property. They'll pay for the restoration project and they'll also pay them for the rights that they give up to keep that land a wetland. Um, it was as, almost as high as $4,000 an acre a few years ago. I don't know if it still is. So policy-wise, there are some things in place, but th there's not a lot of people biting at them because corn prices are good and people are reluctant to come off of agricultural ground. I mean, it's getting sold for development. It's, it's, it's a hard sell. Wetland restoration is, is a hard sell. That's one that looks to a lot of people like turning the clock back. It just does. And, and I would, I mean, I think we could make tremendous gains just by giving up about 10 to 15 percent of the wetlands that we lost, bringing them back online in strategic areas. We could accomplish a ton of our goals, but it is a hard sell. Private property rights. I mean, we're losing the regulation of wetlands, not more of them, um, so I don't know, stuff. <laughs>